Oh man, I had no idea. Actually, I thought this promotion was going to blow up, but not like it is. People are loving the Maps Power Bundle, which is why I'm going to give that one away for free today. What's in the Maps Power Bundle? It's Maps Strong and Maps Power Lift. So Maps Strong is a strongman inspired workout program. Great for stamina, strength stamina, excuse me, muscle building, fat loss, some unconventional lifts, and then of course Maps Power Lift. It's a power lifting routine. Gets you better at the squat, the deadlift, and the bench press. You can get that bundle for free, but you got to do the following. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Turn on your notifications. Subscribe to this channel. Do all of those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you, and you'll get free access to the power bundle. Now, for everyone else, that power bundle is also on sale. Now, normally, if you got both programs, they would retail at $300. But right now, if you go to mapsmarch.com, so it's mapsmarch.com, you get the power bundle, which is st Maps Strong, Maps Power Lift, $79.99. That's it. One payment, $79.99, lifetime access to both of those programs. Once again, it's mapsmarch.com. All right, here comes the show. So I had a really unique experience, uh, actually quite serendipitous. I'm on the plane on the way over here, and there was a gentleman sitting next to me. We started talking. Carlos is his name. And we started talking about business, and he told me how he just sold uh, his pool supply company for, it was producing over a billion dollars in revenue and how he's going to be set, his wife's going to be set, his kids and grandkids, and he was so proud. And then he asked me what I was doing coming over and I said, oh, I'm actually on my way to interview Tony Robbins. And his face totally changes. And he goes, that's crazy. He goes, you want to hear something weird? And I said, yeah. And he goes, when I was 26, so he's 56, right? He goes, when I was 26, he goes, uh, I was going down the wrong path and I bought some VHS tapes <laughs> with Tony Robbins, and he goes slightly old dating. School, and he goes, <laughs> and he's, I was not alive back then. <laughs> <laughs> and he says those tapes changed my life's trajectory. And he goes, it was that point that brought me to where I'm at now. Wow. And I I was blown away uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because what are the odds, right? And yeah. and two, I've heard other people say this about you. And the question I've always wanted to ask you, if I ever met you, was. What is it about you that does this to people? What is it about what you say or do? Because it's really... I don't, it's, I don't think it's me. I just think it's... Uh, I've been obsessed, you know, my entire life with how you increase the quality of people's lives. And I just love people. I, it sounds ridiculous. People don't believe it. But when they go to a seminar with me, they know because, you know, I don't have to work the day in my life and my average day is 12 or 13 hours when... You know, people be thrilled with three hours. Most people won't sit for a three-hour movie, and I'm keeping them completely engaged in a stadium of fifteen or twenty thousand people. And by the time you've done two, three, four days like that, and they've had huge breakthroughs, uh, people there. So I think there's a unique level of of energy and caring and commitment uh, in this category that I have. And I've also just never stopped growing and learning. You know, it's like I love to learn. So you know, I I focus. I've, you know, I've obviously focused on the things that matter, your body, your mind, your emotions, your relationships, your finances, your business, uh, for decades in the spiritual part of life, obviously. But I, I, about 2008, I started to decide, I really want to go super deep at a different level. And part of what triggered me was, you know, the, the abuse that happened in the financial markets. And I've coached uh, a gentleman named Paul Tudor Jones, one of the top 10 traders in history, uh, for about 24, 25 years now. And so I could be an idiot and I have to learn patterns, you know, and somebody pays you sizable seven figures to do something each year, you got to over deliver. And so I've learned so much, but I thought, you know, I think I'm, what I know best is success leaves clues. I've always studied patterns. Like what is it that makes something work and not work? Like you guys know the patterns of, let's say, I'm going to overly simplify, I apologize, but let's just say fitness. Sure you know there are certain patterns that will give you much greater results than others, right? You've done the homework, you've proven it in your own bodies, you're living it, you're living examples of it. So I've tried to do that in all these areas as well. But I started with finance and I went and interviewed, I wanted to help people who were losing half of what they had. So I interviewed Ray Dalio, Carl Icahn, Warren Buffett, I had access. I mean, I'm really good at synthesizing and making it simple and actionable. Because my whole thing is, when I was a kid, I've made things so complex, I think, so I felt intelligent or Maybe I was trying to prove myself to other people. I don't know what the hell I did in my 19, 20, 21, 23, 25 ages. But what I really learned is complexity is the enemy of execution. The more complex, 
the less likely anybody puts it through. Mm-hmm. So it takes a whole lot yeah. more time to take something complex and make it simple so that people, oh, that makes sense and where they can act on it. And so I did that with that. So, you know, two number one New York Times bestsellers, which I was thrilled with, but I was more thrilled with is seeing the economic changes. And I've gotten to meet all those people and hear those changes. And I do business programs. And so I get to hear the stories like you hear all the time, which really touches my heart. Um, but health, you know, it's always been my piece. I had to. I had to be a biohacker to do what I do. I'm on stage 12, 13 hours a day, this stadium full of people holding their attention four days in a row, seven days in a row. So I already had a lot of biohacking. If you go in my house here, I have hyperbaric oxygen upstairs. You know, I got my cryotherapy units. I've got lasers. I got, I got every biohack you can imagine because I need it. But what really triggered me this time was like, I think I can take and show people what's happening in regenerative medicine. Because we're in the middle of where everybody feels like COVID and the world's ending. Right at the same time, we're having some of the greatest breakthroughs in history because we're made of code, right? So now I'm sure you guys know about gene editing and, and gene therapy, but I mean, we got a kid that was on America's Got Talent who now can see again because of gene therapy. You got people with sickle cell anemia that have been cured for the first time. Um, and so there's so many breakthroughs. And so, but what augmented it for me, and one of the reasons I really went for it in this area now, and to answer your question is it's, I care so much, I have the best content I can possibly find because I'm constantly updating, I think, the same as you guys. And third is um, I go until I get the result and I just won't give up, you know, so I can turn people around. I've, you know, I've, I've had 50, what is it? I don't know how many now, but it's, I don't know. Did you guys see I'm Not Your Guru? The yeah. 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 So you saw people there, for example, that were suicidal, you know, knock on wood, after all these decades and thousands of people, I'm able to do it successfully again and again and again and again because I understand human psychology. I know what to make things shift. But in the health area, I've had experiences where I was scared to death of cancer early on. Mm. Like I became successful at a fairly young age. And, you know, we talked about this before we were on camera, like your brain doesn't know what to do that sometimes. And I worked my ass off 20 hour days and I was helping people and turning around athletes and, and CEOs. But then my brain started to go, well, maybe I'm doing this so young because I'm going to die young. It's oh, just wow. like, you know, the, the survival part of your brain kicks in, at least it did for me, and I was not good in those days at handling it. And so I started dreaming about not being hit by a car, but by wilting away of cancer. And then you think about it, enough and sure enough, it ends up in your life. And it first didn't end up physically with me. First, it was my girlfriend when I was like, just turned 20, I think, late 19. And she comes in crying uncontrollably and says, my mother, my mother, and anyway, the end of the story is, her mother was told she had cancer and nine weeks to live. And if it had been me, I might not have kicked in gear because I might have been too fearful. But when it's somebody you love, you know, most of us do more for somebody we love than ourselves. And so I kicked in gear and said, look, you know, my whole belief is Jim Rohn taught me success leaves clues. If someone succeeds at something, they're not lucky. What, are, what do you guys do different with your bodies? It's not luck. You've earned it. You've done something different, but you've done it with precision or you wouldn't get that result. So I was like, okay, there are lots of people that have stage four cancer, thousands, and they're alive. I said, I'm going to do the homework. We're going to find this. She's not going to die. And so I kicked in gear. And then I found this book from a guy that had pancreatic cancer. It was one of the most, you know, deadly cancers you can get. And 13 years, 12 years later, he writes this book and he's totally healthy. And he described what he did to detox his body, pancreatic enzymes. So I went to this woman. Her name was Jenny in her early 40s. And I said, Jenny, I know you don't want to die. I know they're telling you you're going to die. So why don't you read this book? This guy was told he's going to die in six weeks. Yours is nine weeks. Decide if you want to do this. And then I give her, as a man, think of the kind of manager brain or mind and emotions. And anyway, long story short, she had a tumor that was protruding on her back and one in her feminine organs. And after two, three weeks of this, she felt good. Her energy was great. After about 10 weeks, you couldn't see or even feel the tumor here. And so at one point, they did exploratory surgery because she'd outlived the piece. And they found the only thing left was the size of the end of my pinky's fingernail. That wow. was it. And the doc says, this is a miracle. And she said, it is a miracle, but... Let me tell you what he did. He goes, no, it's just a miracle. She's alive today in her 80s, 40 years later. And that kind of took me from, you know, at the effect of the health side to doing my own version of what I think you guys do, which is constantly finding the very best tools to make this body the strongest it can be so I can serve and have this great quality of life for myself and my family and for the people I'm out there for. And so it kind of freed me. And thank God, because about 12, 13 years later, I'm 32. How old are you guys again? You're in your early 40s? 40s, yeah. So... I'm 32 years old. I'm top of my game. I'm working with the best people on earth, Olympic athletes. I'm just, I'm feeling like, wow, life is so blessed. And I'm taking care of my body. I'm cranking and I got great kids and great everything. And then all of a sudden I, I'm a helicopter pilot. So I go to, every two years you have to get another physical, simple physical. 
I get the physical, I leave, and then I keep getting these calls, and my assistant says, the doc wants to talk to you. I said, send me the report. You know, it's not a big deal. And I'm leaving to go to South of France for an event, and then what happens? I get home at 12.30 in the morning, and there's a note there taped to my door that says, from my assistant saying, you must call the doctor, it's an emergency. So then what happens in your head? Yeah, fear. I mean, I'm just like, I, I, my body's got to be perfect. How could this be? And then, then you go, well, I fly all the time. Could the radiation be there? And then all that shit started to come through me. But at that stage of life, I found my center where I was like, you know, a courageous person dies once. You know, the coward dies a thousand deaths in their mind. So it's like, let me see what it is. Wake up the next morning, call the doc, and he says, you got a tumor in your brain. I'm like, what? And it's like, I came, from, there's nothing wrong with me. He goes, I'm telling you, the base of your brain, your pituitary gland, there's a tumor there. It's sizable. I said, how could you possibly know that? And he says, well, you know, I kind of gathered that you have a lot of growth hormone. Yeah, how'd you figure that? My hand's bigger than your face. <laughs> you know, I grew 10 inches in one year. And it's like 16 away, yeah. feet. You know, <laughs> you're, you're brilliant, doc. You know, <laughs> he goes, but I did this blood test and it confirms it. And you need to do an MRI and we need to do surgery immediately. So imagine you're like fit and healthy. You're 30 years old, 32 years old. I'm like, wait a second. What, what, what's the prognosis on this? And he says, well, you know. What are the side effects? He said, well, you know, we have to inform you, you can die, but it's not likely. But your endocrine system will probably never be the same and you won't have the kind of energy that you're probably used to. I was like, well, that's my life. And I said, you know, I, do you mind if you get a second opinion? And he was really pissy. And now, you know, Mayo Clinic has proven, it's useful for your audience to know, 2017 did a study with 286 people. And now they tell everybody to get a second opinion because they found only 12% of the time is the first and second opinion the same. That means 88% of the time it's different. Did not know that. Wow. And so now they recommend, and they now believe you get two or three opinions that refines the diagnosis and you're more likely to succeed or transforming something. But I didn't know then then, but I knew because of Jenny and because of other things I read, I need another opinion. But then you know how you try, I don't know if you ever tried it, it's like blow it off, this guy's full of it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm totally healthy. I flew to south of France, I did this event, and then back of my head, it just wouldn't stop. So I came back, did the MRI, tumor there. Some of it swallowed up on its own, they can't explain how, but still they're pumping all this growth hormone into me. And so I thought, I'm gonna try something different. I'm gonna go to an endocrinologist rather than a surgeon. So I went to this endocrinologist, one of the best in the world in Boston, completely different guy, like the nicest human being in the world. Yes, Tony, you have it, but don't do the surgery, that'd be insane, it's too risky. You know, it goes, go to Switzerland, there's this new injection, you do it twice a year, and I have gigantism, that's what it's called. And what happens is it keeps your arteries from getting too big so you don't have a heart attack. And I said, but my arteries are fine. You told me that they're actually perfect in size. He goes, that's true. I said, then why would I do this? He goes, just to be certain you're gonna be okay. I said, well, what if I'm already certain? I said, I don't wanna be stupid, but couldn't I just measure once a year and if there starts to be an increase, deal with it then? I said, he goes, oh, you, just to be certain you should do this. I said, but I'm not certain that there won't be side effects from the drug. And he was super nice. He goes, and I said, and the, and the surgeon wants me to cut. He goes, the baker wants to bake. The surgeon wants to cut. I want to drug you. He was really cool. And he goes, so that's my preference, but I guess you could do it and measure each year. So thank God I didn't do it. It never got to the U.S. It stayed in Switzerland because they found it caused cancer. So I missed a bullet. Wow. And so thankful. And then I went to six other doctors, and I finally met this doc who said to me, Tony, he goes, yes, you have the tumor, and yes, you have this growth hormone. He said, but dude, you do the equivalent of two marathons in a weekend or more, and two days later, you're recovered. He goes, I've never seen anything like it. He goes, I, I'm sure the growth hormone's playing a role with that. And he goes, I know bodybuilders just spend 1,200 bucks a month to get what you get for free. You know? <laughs> so I was 32, now I'm 62 in a couple of weeks. And in those 30 years I've measured, there's never been a problem. So, and I haven't lived with fear. I'm like, oh my God, what's gonna happen? And that's what I want people to know, is if you educate yourself, there are other options. And it's not that your doctor isn't great. I mean, doctors are the best people I know. This book is filled with doctors, but they're the best in the world at what they do. Not everyone's equal in anything, fitness, health, anything you can do. And, you know, I, I try to explain it. It's like the half-life of medical education now, according to Harvard, is 16 to 24 months. Meaning 16, 24 months later, whatever they learned, half of it is worthless. That's how we end up with the opioid epidemic. Because who educates them now is the pharmaceutical salesman. So imagine you're a doc and you care about your patients so much, and then someone says, this is the perfect solve and it's not addictive, and then they get addicted and die. I mean, I feel for doctors, they give their souls, but you, they should be your coach and not your commander, yeah. and you need more than one opinion. So that's what's really helped me. And then lastly, and finish the story, is why I'm here now, and why I wrote this book now, is I wanted to do this anyway. I wanted to be 150 of the very best. With Money Master the Game, I need to do Ray Dalio, Carl Icahn, Warren Buffett, the 50 smartest people literally in the world financially, all self-made billionaires, all started with nothing, nobody from the Lucky Sperm Club, like cool people. A lot of them became friends. 
It's like, I want to go 150 Nobel laureate scientists, regenerative doctors, the best in the world. And that's what I did. But what really triggered me was one more challenge. I, being an idiot, I'm going down mountain in Sun Valley chasing a guy on a snowboard who's 22 years old and regardless of age, a pro. And I thought somehow in my head I could do the shit he was doing. It was total disaster. I had a wipe. I thought I broke my neck. The pain was so insane. And then what I'd actually have I just tore all my rotator cuffs. And, you know, I'm sure you guys have been in pain in various stages of your life. But this was 9-9 pain. This is nerve pain, you know. Couldn't sleep more than an hour, two nights in a row. Then I found, do you know PEMF? Are you mm. guys familiar with it? Mm. Pulse electronic magnific frequency. This one doc said, don't do the surgery. It doesn't always work. This will at least get the pain down while you find a better solution. And there's 3,000 studies. It'll, if, like, if you break a bone, it'll cause you to recover. It's, it's an electrical charge, magnetic charge. The bone will recover in about 50% faster than if you don't use it. So it took my pain to like a five so I could sleep. But then I still need a solution. So where do you go? You go to the doctors, surgery, 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 surgery. What, what's, you know, what's the prognosis? Well, you may not be able to lift your arm above your shoulder. We have to warn you that. You know, it could tear again. How much rehab? Four to six months. Four to six months with one arm. Four <laughs> 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 days on stage. I, said, I can't do that crap. Are you crazy? So, you know, I work with a lot of the greatest of all time athletes in a variety of sports. Well, the very best. And like Cristiano Ronaldo, right? Supposed to be down for three months, did stem cells. It was done in two and a half weeks, back on, back playing again. So I looked at that and I was like, well, what about stem cells? And all the docs like, no, not for something like this. There's no way, it doesn't do it, doesn't work. And then, you know, I'm hearing these guys say it saved their career. So I called uh, Peter Diamandis, who's a MD from Harvard, but also a rocket scientist, and a friend of mine, a partner of mine in business. I said, who's the best in the world? Who can tell me the answers? And he said, you got to go see Dr. Bob Harari. And he's a neurosurgeon, but he's the first guy that took old rats. You probably remember hearing the study 38 years ago, and he gave them young rats' blood, and they became young again. Their hair got dark, their muscles got strong, and they took that. the old rats' blood and put it in young rats, and they got older. So that started the whole thing in Silicon Valley about young blood, you know, if you heard that stuff. <laughs> but what they found was with stem cells. So he said to me, Tony, once you hit 40, <laughs> sorry guys, your stem cells <laughs> drop off the cliff, yeah. right? Uh, as, especially when you get into your mid and later 40s. And he said, so you're 53 years old at the time. He said, um, you know, if you're going to do something like an elbow or something maybe, but not your shoulder. And then, oh, I left out the most important part. The last doctor I come to, I didn't know him. Oh, my God, Tony Robbins, you're the Tony Robbins. Oh, my God, you saved my marriage. I made $10 million. He goes on. I hear all these beautiful stories. Love hearing them. He goes, okay, now I'm so sorry. I'm so excited, but I got to be your doctor now. And he pauses, takes a breath, and he looks at me and says, Life as you know it is over. No. <laughs> I said, well, you clearly didn't go to my communication yeah. seminar. And he's like, he was like, what the hell? And then he pulls out my spine, and I've been in pain for 14 years. And he goes, you have severe spinal stenosis. Let me show you this. You cannot run, jump. You cannot overlift. You cannot snowboard. He goes, because you do, and you could find yourself unable to walk again. And you know, something punches you in the gut, and you're ready for it. No problem. But I wasn't ready for it. I'm usually pride myself on keeping my head together. It took me about two hours to get my shit together because it's like your whole life's over. Yeah, yeah. And but I wouldn't accept it, obviously. So Bob Harari says, "Look, you need stem cells that have the force of life in it." So I call it life force, even though it's not just about stem cells. And he said, "You need like four day old cells, not your cells." And I said, "Well, I don't want fetal cells." He goes, "No, no, no, no." He says, "When when babies are born." You know, we have the cord, which is filled with this, and the placenta, and most people throw it away. And he's the first person, if you, I'm sure you know, that if you have a baby today, they encourage you to consider saving it for the child. He's the one who created that. So okay, okay. He was, and he saved so many lives with it. It's amazing. But today, you can get allergenic cells, the fancy word for cells from another source. And so I went down. I did three days of these. IV for just 20 minutes. That was it. And a shot. First day, they told me I probably felt tired. I felt really tired. Second day, I had a cytokine response. I knew what it was, so I didn't freak out. I was shaking and freezing for about 20 minutes. I was like, wow, this is intense. But I went to sleep, and I woke up the next day. Not only was my shoulder perfect, and by the way, the MRI shows it's perfect, but my spine, I stood up with no pain in my spine for the first time in 14 years. So I became obsessed. I was like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to go learn everything about stem cells. And then I realized it wasn't just stem cells. It's this revolution in regenerative medicine. And the end of the story is, I get so many people heard about what I did and so forth, and I was asking everybody questions that the Pope invited me to come speak. They do, the Pope every year, every two years rather, does a three-day stem cell regenerative conference because he sees this as a gift from God. He brings in the doctors from all over the world who are the best. So I said, I'm happy to do the cleanup speech the last day, but I want the right to then come with all the doctors and attend all the sessions for three days. They let me do it. Got an education of a lifetime. 
And I, I met two dozen people that were sent home, some to hospice, some just sent home to die because their cancers were so severe. And they're alive today because they met Dr. Carl June at his CAR T cells, you know, or they met another. And, and I started learning about all these different new therapies that most people have no clue about and how effective they are. I met Jack Nicholas there, greatest of all time golfer. He couldn't stand for more than 10 minutes with, without unbearable pain. You can imagine being a guy your entire life, you're an athlete, and now you can't even stand. And so they're going to fuse his spine, which by the way, works less than half the time. And thank God he didn't do it. So he did stem cells and he's now 82 playing golf and tennis. So I was like, I'm going to interview these people. I'm going to find the best. I'm going to deliver it. And so it's been a three-year project. And now I got this tome <laughs> I delivered for people, but the response to it's been off the chart. And I'm, and I'm donating all the money, by the way, just like my last three books, all that goes to charity. We're feeding 20 million meals. I'm I feed, I've fed 850 million people in the last seven years with a goal of a billion. So we're going to hit that early. I'm using this book for that. And the balance of it goes to Alzheimer's and some top doctors in Alzheimer's, heart disease, and cancer. Wow, that's, that's phenomenal. Now, Long story. I'm sorry, but I want no, to hear that. Okay. Okay. I mean, I remember reading that in the book. So it's an incredible story. So I'm glad you shared it. But all the things that you've now experienced and gone through, if you were to go back earlier in your life, are there things that you would have actually started doing earlier related to the biohack, all the biohacking stuff that you're Preventive vetting? Measures, yeah. yeah, no, because most of the things that I know today weren't available then. Oh. You know what I mean? Well, so saying like, that, so what I'm thinking right now, like there's a 25 or a 30 year old that's listening. And are, are there certain things that you would, you would be doing now at 25 or 30 with, the, with that information now? Yeah, I would. I, and I'm sure that's a lot of your audience. I'll tell you one piece, um, be a little technical, but I think I can make it simple. You know, David Sinclair is probably the greatest longevity expert in the world from Harvard. You guys familiar with him? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So David's a good friend. And when I started doing research on this book, I mean, this idea that you could slow aging and then actually reverse aging, um, you'd want to do that as soon as possible, right? You'd want to start that process early. What really makes this break down? Well, it's not your DNA. You'll see in DNA at 26 as you do if you're 86. And your DNA is not your destiny. And scientists know this today. It's your epigenome that matters. Mm -hmm. So those 3.2 billion letters, you know, that make up the genes of your body from your, your mother and your father, that's like the plan. Think of it like a piano. The piano player is the epigenome. Epi means above. So that can be powerfully affected by the crazy shit you do when you're 25 years old, right? Your diet, your exercise, yeah. your lack of sleep, you know, chemicals, you know, any drugs you're taking and so forth. And it starts the process that early to start your body breaking down, we found out. And most people don't realize that. It just starts to accumulate. And for a lot of people, it accumulates more rapidly because of their lifestyle. So your epigenome is fed. This is where we get a little technical. I'm going to give you three words. I hope your audience, they don't have to memorize it. It's in the book if they want, but it's helpful to understand. There are seven master genes called sirtuins. These master genes do two of the most important things in your life. The first thing they do is they turn on or off genes. So no matter what age you are, that's why, you know, cancers are being seen younger and younger, heart disease younger and younger. We're seeing some diabetes younger and younger. That's more lifestyle. But turning on and off those genes is really your whole life. And these master genes do that. And so when you're young and they get enough fuel, they operate real effectively. But again, depending on how much damage you do, accelerates that, right? Second thing it does is it reduces inflammation, which we all know that's the basis of breakdown in the body, right? And the third and most important thing is, you guys know, the source of energy in every single cell is your mitochondria. It converts, helps the mitochondria convert food and creates the ATP, the fuel of your entire body. So sirtuins are pretty important, but they have a second task that when you're really young at 25, it's not a problem. But if you live poorly at 25, it'll accelerate what happens. And that is, it has to also clean up your DNA. So just being exposed to radiation, just from chemicals, even if you're totally fit and healthy, there's lots of things we're exposed to and it starts to disrupt the DNA and disrupts the communication, which is what makes you break down. Mm. And so it goes in and cleans up your DNA for it. It's pretty important. But when the fuel source for these sirtuins, these seven master genes starts to get smaller and it starts in your forties and at 50, it drops off the cliff. And that fuel source I'm sure you've heard of is NAD. Mm. Without an ED, the sirtuins can't do their job. At early 50s, late 40s, it drops by about 50%. So imagine you had a mansion and you have a young staff and your house always looks magnificent because things break, they fix them. That's what happens in life. That's part of anything. That's what's happening in your body. Boom, 7 billion liver cells are gone. Boom, 7 billion new ones are created, right? But now as the staff gets older, and maybe a little decrepit in their mind, and you don't have the raw materials, now your mansion starts breaking down, that's aging, right? So... One thing that you can do early on is you can support the fuel source, NAD, but the precursor you probably know is NMN, never, mother, never. 
you need that precursor for the NED both to be made and to be absorbed effectively. And you can supplement NMN. In fact, you know, a lot of people know about this and promote it. But when I was talking with David, we went out and looked at six different companies together and took them to the lab. No NMN in them whatsoever. And they varied from 35 bucks a month, 120 bucks. And I said to the lab guy, I said, are these people just thieves? And a lot of it comes from China as the original source. And he said, well, some people are thieves, Tony. He said, but more likely it breaks down in 30 to 45 days. So by the time somebody actually gets it, there's nothing in it. Mm. So David has his own NMN, which he's used to take himself from 53 chronologically to 33 biologically. I've done what he's done for less than nine months. I'm, like I said, I'll be 62 in a, f- a few weeks, and I'm 51 in my chronology, and I'm going to get it to the 40s. And so if you did this younger, you just have more energy and strength. But here's the part your 25-year-olds are going to love, as well as your 30 or 40 or 50-year-olds. So David is obsessed, and he's partners with a gentleman with a company called Metrotech. And Metrotech is a company that created a synthetic form, a crystallized form of NMN, it's its own molecule, called MIB626. And it doesn't break down, but more importantly, it absorbs at a whole different level. Like traditional NMN, if you actually get it, you'll get an absorption maybe maximum of 30%. Now, if you get normal NMN to an old mouse, an old mouse like a 70-year-old mouse is like a 24-month, 20-month-old mouse, a 20-month-old mouse can barely run a quarter of a kilometer, whereas a young mouse can do four times that, full kilometer, full tilt, and then they're exhausted and they drop. You give NMN for 14 days to an old mouse, seven-year-old mouse, and it runs two to three kilometers, two to 300% as a young mouse after 14 days. That's how powerful it is. But then I went, when I first started this, I was like, not all mice studies translate, right? Mm-hmm. So this part that's cool. So they built this crystallized version and I found out about it. I actually invested in it so I could learn more after I saw some of the initial results. But they have, it's just been revealed. It wasn't supposed to be, it's top secret. They've been working with our special forces for two years and out of Boston. And they just ended the study. And the commander got so excited, even though it's top secret, he talked to somebody and it got in the press. It was in the Daily Mail about two weeks ago, what they know about it. And it was also in a paper in Boston. But in essence, I only tell you what he said, because I can't reveal something that's not released yet. But what he said is, what we know about mice, in the fittest human beings that we have, we've seen the same result meaning their endurance has exploded to levels he's never seen in these men and women and all the training he's ever done. Their muscle development, which you guys will love, exploded with the exact same stimulus. They didn't increase the stimulus, greater muscle development. They have their, this week, all the, uh, last week, I guess, all the blood came back. They have the blood and the muscle. They know everything that's there now. But the best part was cognition. Cognition exploded. And when you're special forces and you're exhausted, the problem is your energy affects your brain, right? Mm -hmm. And their cognition under pure exhaustion was higher than they'd been able to measure before. And then uh, I met uh, through the owner, he's got a gentleman that was, I think he stopped playing world-class chess at 60 because his cognition just couldn't keep up. He's 72 now, he's been doing this and now he plays world-class chess again. So what's cool about this is the FDA is following this simultaneously. And so, you know, FDA goes through phase one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. So they believe that because they've already done the safety and they've already done efficacy, they think they're going to be in stage three trial soon, which means they hope within 18 to 24 months to have this. It will not be a nutraceutical. It'll be an actual approved drug by the FDA and 300 to 400% absorption instead of 30%. Wow. Wow. Now, will this be available over the counter or only as a prescription? Prescription. Prescription. You have to go to your doctor to get it. Now, NMN is to increase NAD. Why not just supplement with NAD? Why NMN? Um, well, you can, but the size of the molecule, when you talk to David, like, you know, I've done NAD, you know, IVs, I'm sure you guys yeah. probably have as well, right? Found it to be somewhat useful, but it's not absorbed at the same level. You need it for its absorption. And um, and there's other ones. There's, there's something right now called NAD3, you probably have heard about. There's some special formulas of that, which are other forms of precursors that you can do right now, and it can enhance the experience of any NAD you have or any NMN you have as well. So I, utilize, I take advantage of that as well. There's a guy, a guy named Dr. Hector Lopez who's genius. He uses AI to analyze you know, various nutrients and their combinations and impact. He's one of the leaders in the field, and he developed this NAD3, so to speak. Well, this makes sense. I know with uh, certain supplements uh, that the bodybuilding community will use to increase nitric oxide, they used yes. to take arginine, but it gets destroyed in the in the gut. So people yeah. use citrulline, which converts to arginine, which then does yeah, the, the job. So it's very similar. Yeah, sure. Was there anything that surpri- like really surprised you when you were researching uh, some of the topics that you talk about in your book? Well, there are lots of things that surprised me. Um, I'll take something that, that 
when we did research before I wrote the book, I was like, I really want to know what people really care about at different stages of life. So we did extensive interviews with people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And what blew me away was how many people in their late, mid to late 30s were worried about cancer. Mm. Like, you know, I was obsessed by it as a kid, but I was like, I never thought that would be true. And then a lot of Alzheimer's primarily because they've had a grandparent or a parent who's had it as well. It touched them personally. Yeah, yeah. so, and when, you know, I, my father died of Alzheimer's. When somebody doesn't know who you are anymore, it's, you know, you, you don't forget that. Yeah. It creates a concern. So there are diagnostics that, you know, at stage of life, when I was 35 or 40, you guys, I probably, yeah, I kind of blew it off. Who needs the diagnostics? I'm fit as can be, right? But the diagnostics today are a whole different level. Like people think about going to their doctor and tap on your knee and check your ear and cough, right? <laughs> it's, it's, that was from 80 years ago. You wouldn't, you, know, you wouldn't have a cell phone from 10 years ago. But today, the diagnostics have gone crazy. So let's take an example like cancer, because it's happening younger and younger. There's research today. All the people in the book, I tell their stories of these people. They all have something in common that made them create these breakthroughs. They lost somebody they love a father, a mother, a, a wife. And this, this gentleman who came up with this cancer breakthrough lost his wife two and a half years. And if they would have caught it sooner, she would have survived. In fact, the Cancer Society now says uh, that out of 100,000 people they've studied, if you get cancer at stage three or stage four, you have an 80% chance of dying. I prefer the 20% chance of living, but their larger point is it's much harder to turn around and they're right. If you get at stage one or two, you have between 80 and 99.9% .9 chance of surviving. So you want to get, catch it, but the problem is most of the cancers that kill us are the ones we don't test for. So, you know, a woman has a mammogram. When you get older, somebody might, you know, have a, you have a colonoscopy or something. But the ones that get us, we find out usually at stage three or four. I lost somebody like that, stomach cancer. And by the time she had side effects, it was already stage That's four right. because you don't feel anything until then. That's right. So check this out. He lost his wife. He's a very wealthy guy from Google. Hired thousands of researchers, built this entire company, and I think it took him, I don't remember how many years, just a ridiculously short period of time using his intellect and his contacts. He has built up single blood tests that will show you 50 different cancers even before you have symptoms. And I'll just give you an example. We have these Fountain Life Centers throughout the U.S. and Abu Dhabi and so forth. And so we had a guy come in like, I don't know, six months ago. Um, his wife pushed him to do the tests. He was only like 44 years old. And he's like, I'm fit and everything else. I went to the doctor, you know, and they did his blood and his urinalysis. And he goes, I'm totally fine. She goes, no, no, I want you to do this. So sure enough, comes and we give him the Grail test. It's called Grail. And he's got kidney cancer. And, but it's so small, it's so early. It was an outpatient process, took 20 minutes, and he has no cancer. Wow. I mean, it's just like, and then there's another one you should know about. Um, and again, in your mid-40s, you don't think about these things. But I encourage you guys, because because you're so fit and because you're so strong, you make such demands. You're in incredible shape, I'm sure. But then there are things that are beyond what we know because there are genetic dis dispositions, right? So it's useful to know this stuff. Because um, you know, I've had friends in early 40s who were fit as fellow and they, they died on you know, working out or another guy died playing tennis. And so you don't think that way. You think you're indestructible at this stage. So you don't have to have fear. You just say, listen, we're all overly optimistic, but we have no clue what's going on inside here. We know what's going on outside. You look like a million bucks and you got great energy, but just like your friend with the stomach cancer, right? Well, now what's the number one killer of men and women? It's heart disease, mm. right? So my buddies called me, my doctor, I have a partner named Dr. Bill Cap, and he, he built 12 hospitals and did that for 20 years and then just got fed up with sick care and said, this is insane. There's this revolution that's happening. I want to be at the edge of that revolution of precision medicine. So he sold all those hospitals and he built these centers with us. He's just a brilliant man. And he's one of those completely understated guys. There's no hype in this man whatsoever. And he calls me up in his way of delivery and says, Tony, you know, I really want you to come down to the center because, you know, there is this new breakthrough. It's, I'd have to say, I'm, you know, without overstating, it's one of the most important breakthroughs in cardiology in 10 years. And, you know, my heart's strong as can be. I have you know, no, nothing to worry about. But he goes, I really think you should come. Here's what it is. Most people do a CT scan. And he said, what are they looking for? Plaque, right? Mm -hmm. But plaques are not the same. Calcified plaque is hard and it means you're actually healed. Mm -hmm. But soft plaque can break off and make you the widowmaker, they call it, right? Give you a heart attack or give you a stroke at any age, certainly mid 40s, early 40s or 50s. And he said, uh, I really think you should come see this because what they did is a lot of times it's so hard to read. People have false surgeries, all kinds of challenges. He says, it's just the best that was available. But as of today, and we're the first company had exposure, but it'll be available everywhere. It, this thing called a CCTA scan. It uses AI and it digitally opens your arteries and goes in like a heat seeking missile and measures whether it's calcified or soft plaque. 
and gives you a score and tells you exactly where it is in your body. Wow. And they can predict a heart attack five years in advance. And they, but more importantly, they tell you what to do to get rid of it, to change it. So this is like less than six months ago. I'm finishing up the book. And you know, when you're writing a book, I'm sure you guys have experienced this with your work. It's like the last minute you've learned 50 more things yeah. you try to put into this thing. That's why I got so big. And so uh, my father-in-law is just turning 80, my wife's father. Beautiful man, started his own business when he's really young, self-educated, lumber business. So, you know, he looks like you guys, you know, he, he, he did anyway. And so, but when you turn 80, people around you tend to go, you know, you should be getting your affairs in order and all that stuff. He heard so much of this shit, I could just see, you know, some of these psychology changes, their emotion, their energy changes. So I was thinking, how can I help him? So I said, dad, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do this test. I said, doesn't take long. But I think we should go. And I said, you know, both we're at a stage of life where we're going to have some of this soft, soft, you know, tissue here that we got to get rid of. And but they'll tell us exactly where it is. They'll tell us what to do to get rid of it. The soft plaque. Why don't we do this? I said, okay. So I take him with me. My father-in-law has zero soft plaque in his body. His heart is solid as a rock. Wow. I mean, this guy. Like I'm better than I was five years ago, and I'm really doing good. But he didn't have any. I mean, and it was like completely changed him. And then there's this cool technique that we use called relief which I've done for some of the best athletes in the world who think they have a career-ending problem. So I had this ankle problem from being a crazy guy on stage, twerked it. No matter what body work we did or things we did, it, rehab, the nerve was so sensitive that, you know, they gave somebody give me a massage, don't touch the ankle, because it would shoot this fire off this like electrical shock in me. So I went there, and when I first heard about this stuff, they use ultrasound, they see your connected tissue, they see where the circulation is not getting there or if a nerve is trapped, and they put amnio fluid just gently into it and the fluid opens everything up and the nerve pops back in place. It took 15 minutes. I mean, you know, smack the heck out of my ankle now, not a problem. So Pops is there with me, right? And he's got, what makes you feel old is you don't move as well or you move and you're in pain and he had a huge hip problem and couldn't walk right. And so you start feeling frail. So I Pops, as long as you're here, why don't you try this, you know, relief process here. 30 minutes later, they find two specific areas in his hip they repair those two areas. They open it up the, with the fluid. An hour later, he's walking like silk. So we get on the plane. This is my favorite experience with him. He's like this, and he looks at me, and he goes, you know, Tony, those people talk about living to 110, 120. Eh, I don't know about that stuff. But you know what? My heart is perfect, and I walk perfectly. I could live another 20 years. <laughs> People have been married to my, my daughter for 22 years. That's like another lifetime. Yeah. His entire psychology has changed. So I want your viewers to know, regardless of their age, there are some simple tools that are, you do them and you have freedom. You do them and you have peace of mind. You do them, I, it's like I always tell people, ignorance is not bliss, ignorance is pain, ignorance is poverty, ignorance is, can be death, you know, if you don't know. And so th these are some of the tools that are out there that are really critical. Well, not to mention, we know the power of the mind too, right? So just changing his psychology has to have tremendous benefit huge, itself. Huge, huge. What do you think it's gonna take to, to, to shift our, I guess our, our traditional medical system away from, uh, you know, treating an issue that happens to being preventative. Because a lot of what you're talking about is preventative before, and it's and it could save us a tremendous amount, amount of money and lives. Yes. What do you think it's going to take to, to move that direction? Well, even ones that aren't preventative, these regeneration tools, and some of them, like, say, CAR-T cells. Yeah. Uh, CAR-T cells, uh, you know, they had immune therapy back before chemotherapy. That's how long it's been around. But it, they didn't have it mastered, and you know, they, they pretty much fell to the wayside. When uh, Dr. June, who created CAR T-cells, came along, he was like, nobody would listen to him. He couldn't get any funding. He was down to his last, like, $100,000 in his lab. And then he took this man on that had tried everything else. And in one session of gene therapy, you know, uh, you know CAR T-cells, putting these super cells, your cancer often doesn't, your body's immune system T-cells don't recognize the cancer. Right. That's why it grows. So this attaches so they can recognize it. Oh, I see. And, um, and it was a huge breakthrough. But everybody was super skeptical. And it was super expensive, to say the least, to do initially. And he, the first guy he did was supposed to die, and he, he melted in, I think it was two weeks, seven pounds of tumor. Wow and came out with nothing there, then no one thought it would last. They needed an 11-year-old kid. So last week in Nature, it just came out. You know, cancer doctors never talk about cure. But it's been 10 years, and those supercharged cells are still inside them. So what's happening is, it's happening simultaneously. You have so much momentum on the old system, but you're getting breakthroughs that are here. And then some of them, because of the technology price, you know, things increasing and dropping in price, they're starting to get really within range or cheaper, and then insurance companies start to get involved. 
And that's what's going to probably change the system. Like, I'll give you an example. There's a tool for not your audience, but they probably have someone they, maybe they love, a grandmother, grandfather, like Parkinson's. Have you ever seen some Parkinson's and they can't even hold a glass? And so I went and watched this woman in the first treatment, and there's this new technique. It's called incisionless brain surgery. They alter your brain without doing using super-powered ultrasound. And it takes them about, it's an outpatient treatment. It takes them about an hour and a half to find the spot that controls the tremors. And then they treat it in 15 seconds. Have you ever seen somebody get those audio implants and they can hear for the first time yeah. and they're crying controllably? Yeah. I watched this woman who was on 15 medications, couldn't walk across the room shaking, couldn't hold a glass of water, get up, walk across the room perfectly. They hand her a glass of water. She reached out, like didn't even realize and drank the water and then just burst into tears. That was two years ago. A month ago, she just did a 50 mile bike ride. Wow. And this is all outpatient. So it's just like, just so is that gonna, that's available now in 100 hospitals and insurance now covers it. Mm -hmm. So it's like those things, you, the, the biggest thing is going to be economics and results. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as the economics drop, we'll see that change. But guys like us that are more biohackers, we're at the front line. It's like, I, I'm old enough to remember you probably don't because you're too young, but I had the original Motorola stem, or what do you call it, cell phone? You know, it was two feet long. <laughs> the brick, it, yeah. You know, it, it was a foot long, weighed two pounds, yeah. cost me four grand back then, it'd be like 10 grand today. And you had to charge it for six hours so you could get 30 minutes of talk time. <laughs> now you whip out your Apple phone. It's free if you pay for you know, to get a service contract. And it's got 100 times the power of what took the Apollo to the moon and back, right? Yeah. So that's how fast it's changing right now. And gene therapy, another one, I mean, it, it is really changing the field. But the price is still high in gene therapy. But it's cheaper. Like the average person for cancer depends on the type of cancer. It's a quarter million dollars and half a million dollars. So when the numbers are less and the side effects are less and more people know about it, and that's part of what I'm trying to do, give people things they can do right now, simple things, yeah. easy acts, any human do, don't cost you anything. And then here are the things or a small investment in your health could change you radically. And then here are the things that if you got real trouble, you could do. And here's the things to prevent it by doing some intelligent diagnostics. Oh, that's excellent. How much time do you devote personally to to your health and performance. I mean, you, uh, you, it, it, you're obviously Ridiculous. one of the most energy, energetic people <laughs> that you know that people know about. Like, <laughs> that's so nice of you. I, you know, I train like a crazy person, but I train more for endurance because that's what I need most, yeah. most. I used to, like when I was in my 20s and 30s, I want to be as jacked as I could be, and I did, but I didn't do it right, like I'm sure you guys do. So I was always injured, mm -hmm. and so I'd be on stage and I'd have these injuries. I was like, what do I really want for my health? And I, I remember I was 32 and I was like 33, and I was like, I want a level of energy that no one can imagine. That when they're, when everybody else is gone and exhausted, I can go 10 times as much. So I'm, I have all kinds of training. I have every tool you can imagine in my toolbox to maximize, to reduce inflammation. And, um, and, and then what I do for a living is crazy. I mean, think about it. I'm, I'm, I'm burning 11,300 calories a day. That's insane. How do you recover? <laughs> well, that, that guy over there helps yeah. me. <laughs> you're talking but I get in my yeah. oxygen chamber, I get in my cryotherapy, and you, know, you get well, my Well, your training 50. looks a lot like a professional athlete in season, right? Yeah. It's more it's, about- You know the only difference is? I don't have an off season. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what Billy told me. He's like, all the athletes are we're going to have an off season. There's no off season. I had no off season, and you know, this is my 45th year. Yeah, how do you not get burnt? All these years doing this, not having an off season, given all that energy all the time. Uh, because it's what I'm made for. And because it's the most rewarding, like the story you heard, I'm yeah. touched by it, but I hear it every day. I'm, I got a neighbor that's moved down the street and um, one of my other friends is selling him a top security company. He asked for, you know, it's companies like a, I don't know, $200 million company. This guy's got a $2 billion company and he's having lunch. My friend came to see me and he goes and has lunch with this guy to feel him out before they do the deal. And he goes, oh, you know, uh, you know. So, do you live in Florida? You come, I mean, did you come down to visit in Florida? And he goes, Yeah, I was visiting a friend. who was that's your neighbor. It's Tony Robbins. He goes, Tony Robbins. I started my business. I was totally broke. I told my wife, I listen to these tapes. And <laughs> we're going to start this, you know, this business, that's security excellent. business. And now it's a two billion dollar business. You know, so I love hearing all those stories, but I also get to see it in real time. Mm, you see yeah. people transform, and so it's a virtuous cycle. I pour everything into them, but then people are so generous when their lives change, they pour it back, and so. There's this cycle of energy that's different. Now, am I still exhausted? Yes, I'm like, I'm perfect. And I get off stage and by the time I've driven home and now I got, I'm doing it from nearby, um, you know, all the lactic acids in my body and I, I look like I'm 80 years old. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we go detox, cleanse the body, do all those things and build back up and go rock and roll again. And it's so fulfilling. It's like, what could be more fulfilling? I don't have to work a day in my life. I don't need the money or anything. It was like, but I need the meaning. 
the sense of meaning that your life matters. I know you guys know that because that's Absolutely. probably what you do what you do. You know, you know what uh it was funny before we got over here talking to you, you know, some of your team came out and they were talking about how much you love people. And I've heard that a lot about you. Why do you love people so much? I've heard that about you so many different times. It's it stands out, in fact. I don't know why I do it. I mean, no, I just I'm just when I was a little kid, my my mom has now passed away, but people would say it, you know. Was he always like this? <laughs> and she said, I'll tell you a story. And she used to tell people the same story, so I know it well. She goes, I and mean, I barely remember it, but I do remember it. But you know, we lived in the hood in LA, and um, and we lived on a commercial street, and it was a pretty unsafe place. And But my mom was pregnant with my little brother, and there was a liquor store next door. And so, you know, we'd go get bread and milk there, and I was doing it at four and a half years old, five years old, going across there. And my mom said, I sent him one time to go get bread and milk. And I was gone, I guess, for a long time. And I finally came back. And my mom says, where's the bread and milk? I said, well, there's a poor boy there. So I gave him our money. Oh, wow. And she said, we're poor. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I don't know. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm wired with compassion. I know it, some people think it's just bullshit. But when people come and with me for 40 or 50 hours in a weekend, yeah. you know, like I, I have a friend who I met 35 years ago. And he said, Tony, you're not... I thought this guy's so full of it. And in those days, you know, it was the eighties, you know, you wore a suit, you know, it's like, I'm old enough to remember when uh, casual Friday was actually a thing. Now everybody's casual. Yeah, casual every day. Casual every day. But you wore a suit and I wore a three piece suit doing a firewalk, right? But I was up there on the stage and he goes, Tony, I've watched you up there. And he goes, I watched the sweat coming off you and I watched your tie get redder and redder and redder all to the bottom. <laughs> he goes, if this mother, you know what, can jump and do this stuff, I guess I could do it too. So, uh, People start out very skeptical, but after a while, you can't fake it you know, four days and five nights, and I can't fake it for 40. This is my 45th year doing this stuff. I started when I was 17. Now, wow. Tony, you, you mentioned, uh, and this was something, a, a selfish question that I wanted to talk to you about, uh, about being poor, and then obviously you're not poor anymore. <laughs> no. So I would love for you to take me on the kind of journey and evolution of, of money in your life. Like, how has that changed? You know, I know yeah. I came from not very much and, uh, you know, I had a bad relationship with money when I first got it. Did you experience similar things or what was it like for your journey? I, uh, I had four different fathers and uh, my mother was a little bit crazy. I, I wouldn't be who I am without her. She's an incredible soul. But when she took alcohol and prescription drugs, she got insane. And so I had to become a practical psychologist first to deal with things. But what I didn't understand was all the arguments because we didn't have money for food. That's why I feed 100 million people a year, 100 million meals a year is like, it's not because I'm such a nice person. I know what suffering feels like. So I started feeding two families when I was 17 and four and eight. But back in those days, it was pretty rough. And so all the complaints when she divorced my father's was they didn't take care of us. Yeah. So in my head, it's like, boy, you better be successful financially or you're not going to have a family mm. as a little boy. And, you know, I got older to realize if it wasn't money, they would have argued over something else. It's that money was one of the reasons, but it's not the real reason. It's usually something deeper. Uh, but I went out and made a lot of money at a young age. Like I told you, 19, I'm you know, making a, more money than most people would ever dream of. And I did it by doing something I believed in that was so valuable and people were willing to pay for it. But then I'd go back to my buddies I grew up with. And like, I'd say, let's go, let's, let's fly to Egypt and let's race camels between the pyramids. Like, <laughs> you know, like, did you really do that? Competing. You didn't really do that. Yes, really no, did you that. did not. <laughs> you race camels. Yes. It's not comfortable. Oh, you don't want to race camels. Yeah. They're hard as hell on their oh, ass. They're not, not good. They're oh, like, really that's tough. an original bucket but, list. But, right but, but the response I got was not your response. Yeah. The oh, response was, oh, easy for you. Now you have all this money. Uh, yeah. And I'm a love bug, right? So what I really want is love. And so... I know I can see it now what happened. It's like, I was like, I'm not about money. I said, I'll pay for it. Yeah, you'll pay for it. And I got rid of all the money. I didn't do it consciously. I just started sabotaging myself because what I really wanted was joy and love and friendship. I want everybody to have a great time and have a great life. I wasn't, I wasn't about me, ego saying, I'm taking you to Egypt right, or right. some shit like that. That wasn't what I was about. But the, it was so harsh and I felt so judged. So I lost everything. I went totally broke. I moved in this little apartment in Venice, California. It was 400 square feet. Washing my dishes on a, on a little a plate on top of the trash can or, you know, a hot plate. Well, you know, washing the dishes in the, you know, cooking there. Washing the dishes in the bathtub, literally. And then I started, I never did drugs because people in my life when I was a kid did drugs were really intensely abusive physically. And I experienced that. So I never did that. But I used food like a drug. And I would just sit there and eat and eat and eat. And I used to make fun of people who used to sit and watch TV. And I'd be sitting watching Luke and Laura on General Hospital, this <laughs> like, stupid thing here. And, and then I hit this time where I hit a threshold. I, I lost, I lost everything. I was so broke. I remember the day I, 
I was driving home, I've shared people the story before, but I was driving home my little 260Z Datsun along Pacific Coast Highway going towards Venice, and I ran out of gas. And I didn't run out of gas because I forgot to fill the tank. I ran out of gas because I had no money for fuel. And I pulled over and locked the car and prayed they didn't tow it because I had one towed before and I couldn't affect, pay for 40 or 60 bucks to get it out of the tow place. And I walked home, and as I'm walking home, it's getting dark, and I lived on Pacific Avenue, 2516 Pacific Avenue, apartment 3A. <laughs> I walked up the steps, and I get to the top, the sun's setting, I barely see, and there's a note stapled to my front door. And I don't know if any of you boys have ever had this uh, experience no. in your lifetime, but it, it's a document, it's called Quit or Claim. It says, remove yourself and your things, pay your rent, or remove yourself, or the sheriff will do it in three days. So it's my eviction notice. So I take the damn thing off, and you know, I go inside the house, it's dark, and I, I light a candle. Um, not because I was spiritual, because I also had not paid the electric bill. It's a true story. It's a true story. I had not paid the electric bill. So I'm reading by candlelight my eviction notice and going, what the, you know what? I was so angry. And then if that wasn't enough, it's like God has your way with you. You know, it's like, there's a knock on the door. A knock on the door. Like, I owe people money everywhere. It's like, oh, no. I'm on the second floor of this little place. Like, who the hell is that? You know, I got three locks on the outside here. And I'm looking through the, and it's a guy I haven't seen, a friend of mine in probably two years. And he's, He's a good guy, but it's like, I was so humiliated. You know, I was 38 pounds heavier. I got this ugly looking little beard that was scraggly little beard. And I just, it just, and I'm in this little room. I was smaller than the corner of this room over here, right? I had a bed and I had a desk and that was it, right? And so I opened the door, what do you want? And he's like, looks at me. Anyway, he came in, what the hell happened to you? I was like, what are you talking about? I live near the beach. Just, <laughs> I love it here, you know? Yeah. And it's like, and so when he left, something in me snapped. And then like, I didn't know what I was doing back then, but my instincts, now I know physiologically what I was doing, I just said, fuck, I am gonna go, I'm gonna go on a run. I'm gonna run till I spit blood. I'm gonna run till I can't, till my heart's beating out of my chest. And now I know I was changing physiology, which changes biochemistry and changes the way you think. But, and yeah, I'm old enough, I have this Walkman. I don't know if you guys ever had a Walkman. Oh, yeah, yeah, Did you ever yeah, have a Walkman? Yeah, 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 yeah. Holy shit. So, you know, they were this big in those days and giant headphones, you know? And I went to the beach, I took this journal, I set it down, and I, you know, in those days, you didn't have 10,000 songs, you had one album, maybe, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and you had to rewind tape, that yeah, shit. Flip the you know? tape, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, a little cassette tape, right? Yeah. And so I had this group called Heart, and they had this song called Barracuda. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So I went on the beach, and I'm just, I am just, and I am completely out of shape. My stomach's going back and forth, uh -huh. and I'm running as hard as I could run, and when I thought I couldn't run more, I run harder, and finally, I've like literally felt like I was gonna throw up. And I got back to the journal, I draw a line on the page, wrote everything on the page I wanted to change and everything, everything I was and everything I wanted to change. And then I started making these shifts. And so once I made the shifts in my psychology, I was like, okay, if I could be more spiritual, should I? Of course. If I could be more giving, should I? Of course. If I could be smarter, should I work to be smarter? Of course. Well, if I could have more money, should I? It's like, of course. And then, so then I started changing my body. I lost 30 pounds and then 38 pounds and changed my emotions. And then I went in one year from making 38,000 was the most I'd ever made in my life to $1.1 million. And the biggest trigger for me, it's different for everybody, was I suddenly had a son on the way that was not planned. Mm. And I'd always swore I would not have a child because of what I went through until I was wealthy. Well, that was inconvenient. <laughs> and I did it in one year, I made this big jump. Then I made a million bucks a year for like seven straight years, like once your brain adjusts, it's really amazing. I know you guys have got great abundance in your life, you've earned. But I built four more companies. I was living on the road. I remember I was in this place, I was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I, you know, I just traveled constantly. I didn't have a plane, right? So I'm flying commercial. And those days I'm flying coach and I'm bigger than any chair they're gonna put me in. And they booked me in this place and you know, like three, three different cities I had to go through to get to Milwaukee and it's snowy and ugly. It wasn't snowy, it was icy and snowy. And they booked, somebody booked me into the Ramada Inn, which is not a bad thing, but this one was bad. And there's like all these animals on the wall and I was a vegan at the time and they're all <laughs> mildewing and smelling. And I go to the front desk and it's almost two in the morning, but I get there and the guy's like, Robbins, click, 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 you know. Nope, you know, like, you, ever been, you know, you get on a plane, you've been flying forever, and like those last five minutes when you're standing up, if they called you, and I'm like, sir, I was like, I know you care, I, know, I, I need you to find my room really right now, I've had a full day, I gotta be up in four and a half hours, and it was my birthday, and I'm waiting for my family. So anyway, long story short, I go upstairs, and I gotta carry my own luggage, he doesn't have a bellman at that hour. He goes, but I'm gonna give you the presidential suite since it's your birthday. <laughs> I wonder what that looks right, like. At the Ramada Inn, right? 
<laughs> Open it up. First, the smell hits you, the mildew smell. Next, orange and green shag carpeting from yeah. the 1970s, right? But I was just, I called my family, and this was a tipping point that changed my life financially. Because I was already doing well, but I had no lifestyle. And so I called back home, wanted to speak to my kids. It's late for them. And um, I woke them up. But the woman answers is Maria, who was my housekeeper and took care of my kids, a really beautiful lady. And she says, Mr. Robbins, happy birthday. I'm so glad you called. This is so amazing. I've wanted to thank you so much. And by the way, I don't think I've, have you noticed what's happened in my body? And I'm like, well, no. Well, yes, Maria, what, what has happened? She goes, I have lost 32 pounds practicing what you teach. She says, it's amazing. She goes, you know, yesterday, she said, I was in your sauna and I was just sweating like crazy. And it was right after I watched Oprah while I was on the, the stepper. And she said, I was thinking, I am so lucky. I live in this castle. This is amazing. And she goes, and last night I was sitting in your jacuzzi, you know, looking down on the water. <laughs> and I literally, this is a true story. And I literally thought to myself, this bitch is wealthy. <laughs> I'm at the Ramada Inn, like traveling around, right? Uh, so that was the next level. Yeah. Then I snapped and it was like, okay. I made a million bucks because I had a reason beyond me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was like, what would take it to the next level? And it's different for everybody. I'm not saying it's right for everybody, but I'm driven by contribution. So there was this man who uh, fed all the people in San Diego, or fed a segment of the homeless people in San Diego. Brother Bennett was his name, and he made these breads. So I called him up, and I said, how much would it take to feed every person in San Diego in need? He goes, well, I don't know. I said, go do your homework. I said, because I want to fund that within three to four years. And he came back and it was three million bucks. And I was like, three, three million bucks, you know? That's a lot of money. And I made three million bucks the next year. And I funded it. And by the way, I went back like 20 years later. He's now passed away. He's a beautiful man. And they have four centers that were the original ones that I started there. They still feed people there. So then I got hooked on contribution. And I've certainly had lifestyle because who you spend time with changes how you think about things as well. And so I developed a different peer group. They were all billionaires. I was coaching different people. Yeah. So, you know, I'm getting in their private jets and everything else and having this experience and thinking, I don't see any way I could ever do this, um, but I was wrong. It takes time. And I started to develop more skills and I started to figure out how to really run businesses. So I have 105 companies now. I do $7 billion in business across all these different industries from entertainment to education to AI. And, and I know what to do in those areas. That's why I help businesses. That's one of my favorite things is turning businesses around and showing them how to grow a business. But along the way, I remember my friend Peter Guber, I was with him on a trip and all these guys were saying, Peter's made $25 million on this one film. And Peter doesn't talk about stuff like that. He's not driven by ego, but the other people are all talking about it. And I remember I was like so depressed, like I could never make $25 million. I mean, and, and then they all had yachts. And I didn't even want a yacht, but I just felt like I, I didn't belong there. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Right. And then, you know, when I came out and said, I don't really want a yacht. And I don't even want $25 million, but I want to make sure I can do whatever I want. If I wanted to, you know, I was feeding people already at that time. If I wanted to feed, I didn't think of a billion at that time, 50,000 people, I want to be able to do that, you know? So again, I found my triggers. And then, you know, three or four years later, I'm, you know, having this year, and I, you know, I made $50 million. And then I, then I took a company back and made $400 million. Wow. And so, but what's interesting, the, when I got the 400 million, I was on stage in um, the Continental Center in New York. 15,000 people doing what I love. I was out of my mind. And during a stretch break, guy came up and said, company went public, your stock's with $400 million on top of all my other assets. And I was like, that's insane. That's incredible. And then I went right back to what I was doing. Didn't change a damn thing. And I went home that night and I was actually depressed. I'm never depressed. It's actually a common thing when, when people go hit like a, a reach something like that, that high. Well, you know, the three guys on the wall there, not Tom Brady, he, not him, but two Olympians over there you just saw, they're friends of mine. When they came here to talk that day, they both talked about achieving the gold and then being depressed. Yeah. And I, I'm old enough to remember there was just a thing called VH1. They had this thing called Behind the Music, and it was always a story. Oh, it sounds yeah. like you yeah, know yeah. what I'm talking oh, about. Yeah. It was always a story of a band that they made it to the peak, and then yeah. somebody killed themselves, or yeah. they got a car Marley accident, or overdosed. Crazy. It was always the same story. <laughs> yeah. And well, the reason I was that way is I was not happy in my relationship. So here, from my mom, I thought money was going to be the solution. I didn't want to ever get a divorce. But I was with somebody that was a good person, but we had almost nothing in common. And I had changed myself to please her. Like the guy you see on stage, I'm the same guy. But I go home and try to be more quiet and try to be this. And I was trying to be a pleaser. And it made me so miserable. I said, I'm going to change my life. So I went back to almost nothing financially because she got like an eight times multiple on my companies. And they were small companies in those days that depended upon me. So I had to work, start over, work a whole nother period of time. The company I took public, that was 1999. 
stock dropped through the floor. Whoa. So I literally was starting over at 40. Um, but now I'm light years from where I was back then, you know, beyond where I was back then. And I'm grateful because, you know, I trust in a higher power and guidance and doing the right thing. I've learned so many things that, truthfully, I don't know if I would have been as driven. I still would be for impact because it's still what drives me. It's never been money. But my journey has been money's evil. Money, money's the answer. Money's evil, so get rid of it. People won't love you. You'll be judged to screw that shit. I'm going to be abundant in everything. To, wow, let's do this another scale to... Like I, I got to the point where it's like, you know, I have an island, I have planes, I have a BBJ, I've got all these crazy things. I'm not bragging. Just, you could take all that shit away and I'm still the man I became. But I got to a point, it's like, what's next? And then it was like, what's always driven me is contribution. So that's when I came up with like, okay, I called my team and I said, I was doing Money Master the Game and I'm interviewing these billionaires, great guys. And then I watched Congress cut the budget on food stamps, it's called SNAP program now. I think it was six billion, if I remember right. It was the equivalent of everybody who needs food giving up a week's worth of their food once a month, unless you, you and I, people from the general public, step in. So I said, how many people I fed? They said 42 million. I didn't know it was 42 million. I was like, that made me proud. And I was like, what if I did that in a year instead of a lifetime? What if I fed 50 million people? And then my brain went, what if I fed 100 million? Then I was like, what if I fed a billion people in 10 years? And I got so excited and was like, okay, I'll give all the profits in my book. That's not gonna be enough, but it's a good start. And then I contacted Feeding America and became partners with them. And now, seven years later, we're at 850 million meals on the way to a billion. That's I'm so actually awesome. doing a billion person X Prize to have sustainably a billion people around the world. I've got the heads of the UAE who've partnered with me. I put up a million, they put up 19 million of a prize. So all these people are competing, smartest people in the world about how do we find Excellent. food sources. But then it was like, okay, I got a plane. Like, what's my, I want to be conscious. It's a privilege, but I want to be conscious. What, what does that do? Well. I found out my burn rate was 3,000 you know, trees a year based on what I was doing. So I didn't just go buy credits, I bought them for 10 years, but I said, I'm gonna plant 100 million trees. So now I've planted 71 million trees. I went to India, I'm watching these children die of waterborne disease, it's so easy to solve. So I was like, I provide a quarter of a million people a day with fresh water in India, families, I'm trying to get it to a million, that's the goal. Um, and so that's the shit that drives me now. And that's the place that I wasn't at at 40, so it's pretty hard to be at 40. But if you guys continue to grow, you can pick whatever that version is for you. But I'll tell you, there's nothing like helping someone who can't even thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What it does inside you, if they never said anything to me, you know? It's a different world. What do you think, what do you think is the, the number one thing you're, you're misunderstood about? <laughs> I, don't, I don't try to get people said. I think some people think I'm positive thinking and, you know, and I never believed in positive thinking. I believe in intelligence. I believe in seeing it as it is, not worse than it is though and then doing something about it. Like, don't go to your garden and go, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, and chant a bunch of shit, pull the goddamn weeds out, you know, that's it. So I think some people may think that about me, but I really don't think about or care. I'm not here to try to convince somebody who the hell I am, you're wasting your time. Um, I'm here for people that are looking for answers and are open, and I like to talk about ideas that matter to the people who care. That's kind of the approach that I learned from my teacher, Jim Rohn, years and years ago. What are some of the most common uh, ways people are in their own way? Because I know you work with a lot of people. Are, have you seen commonalities of, of, of reasons why people are, just get hit a block? Well, yes, there are many. Um, but one of the largest ones is we all have the same need structures, I discovered, by being around, you know, I'm a student of patterns. And when you've been to 195 countries and all these cultures, you start seeing, you see the same pattern in different cultures. People raise different, same patterns, same emotions, same problems. And so I began to realize we have the same needs. We might have different belief systems. We might have different even values, but we have certain needs. Like we, everybody needs certainty to some level. Some people value certainty as the number one thing, so they live life differently. Some people, it's the sixth thing on the list. So it's still needed, but it's not as big a priority. We all need uncertainty. Without variety, we feel dead inside, mm -hmm. right? So too much certainty, you're bored out of your mind. Too much variety, you're freaked out. You don't want to be lukewarm middle. You want to learn how to use them both. So did you ever watch a movie you've already seen before? Yeah. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have too. Why do we do that? Yeah. You're certain it's good. You think it's been long enough that you'll still get variety from it. You uh, forgot enough, it'll be variety. Funny. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it, right? So you can meet more than one need at one time instead of having them be parted. But the one that messes people up the most is we all have a need for significance, to feel important, to feel special, to feel unique, to feel needed. Everybody has that need. Some people do it by the way they dress. Some people do it by developing themselves the hard way, their body, and doing something unique with their life. Some people do it by being more generous. Some people do it by tearing other people down. 
like everything. You can get certainty by, you know, drugging yourself or you can get certainty by working your ass off, working out and feeling so strong you feel certain or you can get certainty by trusting in God or looking at your own life and saying, I've always figured it out, I'll figure this out as well. So you can get your needs met in a negative way, a neutral or a positive way. How you meet them changes your life. But also everyone has the same needs, but we have different uh, sequences of how we value them. So our culture today, and especially social media, has made significance number one. Mm. And so you see people like, Billy will tell you, like he's in he his own gym. And the first time he told me this, I couldn't believe it. He goes, you should see this. He's, this one, men and women both do this. Come in, they lay out everything, take all these pictures and then post them and they don't work out. <laughs> it's just like, it's all, it's, illusion. it's all bullshit. It's all just to look good, right? It's all projection. And then people watch Facebook, oh, I'm not like them. And then they get depressed and messed up. So that need for significance is a good need to have a significant light, an important light, a unique life. But it, when it's number one above love or above growth or above contribution, it's gonna mess up your relationship. You get two people who are significance driven at the top and they basically wanna kill each other. And unfortunately, our culture has reinforced it. Our culture is certainty and significance at this stage. People want certainty, that's people at home with their mask and everything else, you know, if they're in their car in a mask and there's nobody with them. Yeah. They're out, there's a guy on a paddle board out here wearing a mask. <laughs> Well, there's nobody around him. I'm like, what is going on? But certainty, mm -hmm. absolute certainty. It's number one for him. I know just looking at him, right? So there's nothing wrong with any of these. But if you think about it, you, know, you can even have the same need, but you have different ways of knowing the needs met. So 9-11, you had firemen and policemen who went up there knowing they likely weren't going to come out and gave their life. Why? Because they wanted to be a hero. They wanted to have a significant life. They wanted life to have special meaning, even if it meant death. That's how strong the drive is. But you also have Osama bin Laden who got significance by destroying 3,000 people's lives and buildings, but he didn't do shit. He didn't take any risk. He got other people to do it. He's one of, I forget it is, like 27 children. And he didn't matter to his father much. At least he didn't perceive he did. But he goes to Afghanistan with his daddy's money, the biggest construction guy in Saudi Arabia. And all of a sudden he gives his money and he's a hero. And so people are shaped by these needs, but the ones that harm us, like if your love is first or if growth is first, so it's certainty, uncertainty, significance, love, um, both expressing and receiving, growth and contribution. Everybody meets the first four because they're survival. Mm -hmm. But the ones that make you fulfilled are growth and contribution. Mm -hmm. So it's like you see people and they go, well, what's the secret to happiness? I always say one word, progress. Progress equals happiness. If you've ever achieved a goal and then went, is this all there is? You know it's not getting it. Or even if you achieved a goal and you were thrilled, how long were you happy for? A year? Nine months? Six months? Three weeks? Three days? Three hours? Most people, it's somewhere between three hours and three weeks, maybe three months, because we're not made to just sit here and be satisfied. Everything in the universe grows or dies. Everything in the universe either contributes or is eliminated. So when you're making progress, you feel alive. When you achieve something, if you sit at the table of success too long, you're bored and fat, you know, it's horrible. So I try to show people how to make those higher needs be met. Because you can lie to yourself and make yourself certain. You can feel significant by tearing somebody else down. That's what most people do, sit on their little computer and type shit. You know, they never say it to your face. No. You know, not, especially not you guys. <laughs> Probably not me, right? But they'll do it there. Why? Because it's their way to instantly get significance without doing anything. If I make you look smaller, I have the illusion I'm bigger. But it's an illusion. Where do you think we're going with like social media and the metaverse and Web3? Like, what are your thoughts on that? You think good it's going to be good or bad? Well, it, it doesn't matter what I think because it's going to happen regardless. Yeah, right? So yeah. electricity can light up a city or kill someone. It depends on how you use it, right? So my hope is that social media, there will be alternatives that provide freedom. I think the biggest challenge with social media, besides I'm sure you guys have all seen Social Dilemma and you know how yeah. they're treating us like rats, using our dopamine centers and making us do crazy, stupid things and separating us. But I think human beings are getting to a threshold, just like COVID is getting to a threshold. You know, you're seeing them, countries now dropping them all. Part of it's political and they're, they're gonna be thrown out. You know, people are fed up. They wanna go back to their lives. Um, and there's a lot of science that shows that it's, it's evolved. It's very different than what we were told initially. So I think we're hitting thresholds around social media. I don't think we're there yet. And, and you've already seen for the first time, Facebook lost members for the first time last yeah. quarter. Mm -hmm. Their numbers are down. Now I'm sure you know, he, he wants to be meta now and you know, go to the metaverse. And the metaverse is interesting. I had a VR company, I sold it to Apple and um, they haven't come out with what they're gonna do yet. But I know to some extent where they're going, they don't tell you beyond what we knew initially. But you think about it. You, at, what is it, at 8K is what they're targeting. 
you know, a year and a half later, it'll be 16K. A year and a half later, a year later, it'll be 32K. Between 32K and 64K, you can't tell the difference between right. this yeah. and virtual reality. So we're probably somewhere between four and six years away from that. And it's going to be a different world. And just like right now, you know, I'm not a gamer because I grew up in a different generation. And also, I just want the time. <laughs> I know I'm an addictive personality, so I don't do it. But, you know, gaming can give you some interesting skills. You know, I'm an esports team. You know, Team Liquid, one of the best teams. These guys are making, you're supposed to say, what are you doing gaming? Well, these guys make a million, million, two million, five endorsements. They can make three or four, five million, you know, teaching other guys how to play, uh, you know, on the various platforms. So there's options that are there. But I think um, the real challenge for humanity is going to be how do we keep growing, especially when also so many jobs are going to be wiped out by everything from AI to robotics to nanotechnology. You know, you look 20 years in the future, it, that probably sounds like a lot to you. Uh, it sounds like a lot to most people. But when you're 60, you feel differently. It'll go like that. And I got, you know, a 48-year-old daughter and a 10-month-old daughter and, and five grandchildren. I look around at my kids and go, my grandkids, and say, Half of what they know is a job is going to be gone. So how do I help them succeed? I need to teach them the three things that aren't going to go away when those jobs go away. There's three master skills. Every one of you have it. I'm not throwing to smoke your way, but you have it. I know it because of what you've produced. The first skill that makes somebody great in business, finance, your body, relationship, parenting, anything, is pattern recognition. Like a lot of people right now look around the world and say, oh my God, this is all chaos. It's not chaos. It looks like chaos. If you studied history, you know there are seasons. We're in a winter. No pandemic lasts forever. No war lasts forever. Spring is coming. That doesn't mean there aren't going to be challenges, but the overall themes will change over time. We've probably got six, seven more years of something like this. We're going to have to deal with China and a bunch of other things that are coming up. But all those seasons are really helpful. If you're born in 1910 and you come of age at 19 years old, that was 1929. They saw the end of World War I looked like great, roaring 20s, cars, new and they were going to go party. And they turned 19, the world looks like it's over. Oh, by the way, they make it through those 10 years to make it to 29 years old, and it's 1939. <laughs> and the whole world is at war, and Hitler looks like he's winning. And they were flappers. They were like what you hear people talk about, millennials, you know, now. Oh, they, you know, they're snowflakes and all that. And Z generations now tell millennials, you're old, you part your hair in the wrong location and <laughs> shit like that. You know, it's, it's, it's absurd. But here's the good news. Those demands made those people what we call the greatest generation. The guys that came back, they were the heroes. And then they started a new season, a springtime. The late 40s, 50s to early 60s till Kennedy was shot was a different season right? That was a new springtime. Growth is easy, just like that stage of life growth is easy. Then we went through the hot summer where there's internal conflict. Think about how different the 60s and 70s were from the 40s and 50s after World War II. Then you got the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and everything changes. People are about pragmatic, making money, doing these pieces. Not everybody, but the culture changed. And we're right now, we're in winter again. And we're about halfway through it, probably. It's probably another seven years, eight years, depending upon studies. And so, uh, here's the history of the world. Weak people, we'll start with, let's say, good times make weak people. I was just going to ask you right? if you believe in that proverb. That's such a great proverb. That's so true. Weak people make bad times. Bad times make strong people. Strong people make great times. That's the history of the world. And so, you, but you don't have to be part of the pattern. Like, I live in Florida. You know, winter somewhere else is pretty bad. Winter here is pretty nice, as you notice today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 78 degrees, yeah, we're bad. doing great. So you don't have to be what everybody else is, but you do have to learn how to use the seasons of your life. And I think that's what's really missing. That's what people are doing. They have lost perspective. So if you have pattern recognition, if you recognize patterns in business or in finance, you have power. It's not chaos. Patterns of history, you got power. Patterns of life stages is something I study, right? So you understand where things are going. And then the second skill is pattern utilization. Because if you recognize the pattern, the real key is can you use it? Like, can you use stress, not let stress use you? Can I use the changes in the culture to go to another level? You know, I'm, I'm reaching 2.7 million people this year instead of a quarter of a million people traveling to 15 cities, excuse me, 125 cities in 15 countries. I'm home with my kids and having a good time, right? I took advantage of COVID, not let COVID take advantage of me. That's not easy, but it's doable, right? And so the third one is pattern creation, which is I'm sure what you guys have done, right? You probably start out learning and studying other people. So you studied so many things. Now you create your own patterns for your workout. You know what it is. You know how to get precise. You got the history. You play someone else's mu music on the piano. And then one day, you know enough, you can play your own music. And that's what you want to do with anything. So anything you want to master, your finances, your business, parenting, your body, you got to make it 
study of mastery, not of dabbling. And you guys aren't dabblers, so you understand what I'm talking about. And you know pattern recognition. You could look at somebody probably and go, this is what they need, like that, right guys? Mm -hmm. Right, because this is your domain. I would encourage all of your viewers, especially the young ones, to decide there's a few domains to master. One is what you're doing. I do it too in my endurance side. But the other is their emotions, the other is their relationships, the other is their finances. And then maybe this thing of spiritual joy and happiness that really comes from not having life be so much about you and maybe about something bigger. Wow. Amazing. Well, this has been amazing. Yeah. Totally. I've enjoyed our time. I, I yeah. really enjoyed talking to you. You are uh, everything people say you are. Yeah. All the yeah. good stuff, at least. <laughs> well, I hope they good yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you for showing us around, too. Yeah, it's been my pleasure, guys. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. I hope, I hope your people pick up Life Force. It's, uh, like I said, I'm donating all the profits out there. If I don't get anything out of it, but they will. And it's through your project. And I want them to know these tools that can change their life. Yeah, I highly recommend it to my viewers. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it.